Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I'm Louise Palanker. Here on Media Path, Louise and I scan the globe, finding interesting ways for you to be entertained. We like to be the pilot light for your curiosity. Books and movies and TV shows and music, all formats. As a matter of fact, today our guest is one of those talented people who has been involved with some of the most iconic music of our lives, Billy Sherwood. This is going to be like a boomer fever dream when we get to talk to Billy in just a second. But first, Wheezy, what have you unearthed for us this week? Well, over the weekend, uh, Fritz, I watched a CNN special report called Inside the QAnon Conspiracy. So, you know, My I, friend uh, Anderson Cooper. Oh, yes, with Anderson Cooper. So it delves into the origins and beliefs of this conspiracy group. The special is an investigation into how they operate how they attract new followers, and the dangers they present. In an increasingly confusing world, folks who yearn for clear lines between right and wrong are drawn to a conspiracy theory, which ironically is blurring the lines between cult, conspiracy theory, and burgeoning religion. But the Q conspiracy offers both the comfort of structure and the engagement of puzzle solving. In order for any set of nutty theories to take hold, they need to first align with a pre-existing worldview. In this case, it's one that gives the illusion of elevating a subset of humans by demonizing others. So Q pulls from the classic conspiracy hit parade. You've got education is dangerous, Democrats are taking your guns, and Jews eat babies. Um, <laughs> I know. I, think what, I know. Tell, tell me the convincing part. How do they convince people? Well, it's, just... you know, once you go down that rabbit hole, literally on the show is the following quote There is a man who has jumped himself out of the cult who looks directly into the eyes of Anderson Cooper and says, Anderson, I'm so sorry. I thought you ate babies. Yeah. So I, I heard they, that's the, what they use for the promo. What a great yeah. promo. Yeah. So, wow. you know, an apology, I think, goes a long way in this instance. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to posit that I think we may be better able to understand the psychology that drives people towards an idiotic conspiracy by studying the social experiment that is The Bachelor. So this season's Bachelor, Matt James, is long, he's lean, he's dashing, he's kind. And I would like to argue the thesis that this season, the show has been able to identify the set of phenomenon that inspire isolationism, false supremacy, prejudice, bullying, and conspiracy theories. Wow. So you take 25 women, hear me out, you take 25 women in search of a basic human need, love, and you create severe scarcity. They are all vying for the attention of the one guy, but they live and associate mostly with each other throughout most of this experience. So humans are social, humans need humans. So the women form a barely balanced society, needing one another for daily emotional support while also competing for the one available mate. Now, what The Bachelor did this season was three weeks into the experiment, they introduced five new females. To the remaining original 15 contestants who already nurture tense but established relationships with one another, the new women offer nothing of necessity for survival and only competition for the one available male. So this scenario rapidly devolved into shunning, cruelty, otherizing, name calling, and conspiracy theories. Oh, well, I heard she's an escort. That happened wow. like within one week. It was like fast tracking a conspiracy theory. So I think that like much like marginalized and lower middle class white folks who felt entitled that at least their whiteness should provide them with some level of supremacy. You introduce people of color who are outperforming and out earning them. And rather than seeing their humanity and their contributions to society, the aggrieved see only the threat and competition for a perceived scarcity, jobs, money, status, even women. Right. So once you decide that someone poses a threat to your safety, security, ideals, survival, that person can be dehumanized in the name of self-preservation. Therefore, I believe that we could address crucial societal discord issues with a cabinet position in the Biden administration for <laughs> Chris Harrison. <laughs> wow. You just gave that show far more credibility than it deserves. And that was fun to do. And that guy's got great teeth, man. So yep. <laughs> I understand. Wow. Well, that's a really, you think the showrunners sat around and sort of parsed this and plotted it out? No, they stumbled okay. upon it in search of drama. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, 
I got a couple of books for you this time. Uh, since the Capitol insurrection, as we like to call it, January 6th, we've all started to realize how fragile this American democratic experiment really is. We've all been asking ourselves, is this whole thing falling apart? Are we going to survive this? Well, it's hard to answer that, but we should know that we are not alone in what we are experiencing right now, which called my attention to a recent book by Ann Applebaum. She's a writer for The Washington Post and The Atlantic and The Spectator and The Economist. She specializes in Eastern European governments. She won a Pulitzer Prize for Gulag, which is the history of Soviet concentration camps, a happy subject. She developed a think tank ab about how governments in Europe are transitioning away from democracy and toward right-wing populist authoritarian forms of government. It's called Democracy Lab. She compares three countries where democracy is currently under attack. Poland, where her husband was a high official of the Polish government, the UK, and the US. And she explains the lure of right-wing authoritarian governments. And this is the one that made my hair on the back of my neck stand up. They use conspiracy theories. They use political polarization. They use social media. They use nostalgia, like make America great again. You know, other countries have adopted that slogan. Most recently, Spain used the campaign, make Spain great again. So I don't know if there's any solace in that. We are not alone. Fascinating. Interesting book. I mean, Her husband like, is like the assistant prime minister of Poland. And it, it just sounds like the United States, but farther down the tunnel. Really mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. Democracy is a delicate balance. What else you got? Anything else? Oh, I have. Uh, this is fun pandemic viewing. I have Cobra Kai on Netflix. Are you familiar <laughs> with this one, Fritz? Yes. yes, I am. Yeah. Dive in. It's a blast. Okay. So 30 years after the events of the 1984 All Valley Karate Tournament, a down and out Johnny Lawrence, played by William Zabka, seeks redemption by reopening the infamous Cobra Kai Karate Dojo, reigniting his rivalry with a now successful Daniel LaRusso, Ralph Macchio, who has been struggling to maintain balance in his life without the guidance of his mentor, Mr. Miyagi. Ralph Macchio and William Zabka reprise their roles as Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence from the 1984 film, The Karate Kid. And basically, I was telling my family about the series, and they're like, well, what if you've never seen The Karate Kid? And I was like, all right, here you go. This kid gets bullied. Mr. Miyagi teaches him karate and he uh, triumphs. That's all you need to know to watch Cobra Kai. Like, that's basically the movie. So uh, it's a lot of fun. And it probably is inspiring a lot of people to go back and rewatch the original movie. Wow. Very good. I love those commercials on TV. It's the just, it's so, fun. Sort of and the episodes are short. They're like, you know, the half hour episodes, if you, you know, enjoy, if well, you enjoy that type of thing, it's fun. And it's all, it's, well it's just fun to see how people grew up, you know, Ralph Macchio. And well, and I like the fact that you, uh, you mentioned the title of the piece and I didn't even say the title of the book I was just talking about. It's called The Twilight of Democracy by Ann Applebaum. Sorry. Oh about yeah. That. Titles help got, people find things. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. My second book is, uh, I know this is odd, but I'm telling you, it's the U.S. Constitution for Dummies. It's by Dr. Michael Arnheim. How many have the guts to admit that you never read the Constitution? I raised both hands. <laughs> Even when I was supposed to study it in ninth grade, I wasn't studying it. And that's fairly embarrassing to admit that as a U.S. citizen. The Constitution, though, has become really a part of our political discussion these days, and we can't avoid it anymore. So I found us an off-ramp to our civic cluelessness, which is a book called The U.S. Constitution for Dummies. It's like all the books for dummies. It's got that same yellow and black cover, but it's not really for dummies. It's just a simplification of the basics, and it's really good. And the Constitution, as you know, needs simplifying. This is plain speaking, a guided tour that helps you to understand the big issues like Roe versus Wade, the rules governing impeachment right now, Supreme Court appointments, interpreting the Constitution. It's worth it. Read this book. Then when you're at a gathering of family or friends, <laughs> you can whip out your little pocket Constitution and say, sure, the Super Bowl will be really good this year, but who can tell me the difference between an originalist and a textualist in interpreting the U.S. Constitution? And at that point, your friends will ask you to take your guac and chips and go sit in the car, but <laughs> you will feel good about yourself. So it's really good. I'm really enjoying it. It's a primer. It's stuff we should have learned in eighth or ninth grade, but I didn't do it. Now, Weezy, 
We've got to get to our great guest. I'm yes. so looking forward to talking to Billy. Yes. Billy Sherwood is a musician, a record producer, a mixing engineer. He's been a part of one of the most historic progressive rock bands. Yes, where he's played guitar and bass and keyboards. And he's been a part of other groups, too, some of them offshoots of Yes, like World Trade and Circa and Conspiracy and Yoso. In 2017, he joined Asia. He's also had a prolific solo career. He's produced albums like Back Against the Wall and Songs of the Century, which is fantastic. It's an all-star tribute to Super Tramp. Billy Sherwood, we're so happy to talk to you today. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be here and part of the show. Thank you. Listen, I, I want to uh, get into your, you know, your musical talent is hereditary. You've got a great history with music. But I, 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 I want to talk about the term progressive because bands like Yes and the Moody Blues and Jethro Tull and Emerson Lake and Palmer and Pink Floyd and Asia are all progressive. And we don't hear that term anymore. What does progressive actually mean? I think... Uh, it is a way to kind of express a music that isn't bound by structure in the way that pop music is kind of bound by a three and a half, four minute structure uh, where you've got your two verses, your choruses and your bridge. Um, and it all makes the song happen real quickly and nicely in, in a tight package. Uh, progressive rock is, is like an art form that allows you to expand those uh, rules and actually create whatever you like. I mean, for instance, the Yes album uh, called Tales of Topographic Oceans, which is one of the first uh, of my love uh, of their band, that record, was four songs and it was a double album and each side of the record was a full song and it was 22 minutes long or however it was. So it's an expression of art that allows you, I think, and that's why I love the genre so much, to just be completely artistic and creative without any uh, rules that apply to anything. And, and just one other add to that, Wheezy, because it's part of the same question. That's the point I'm really trying to make by asking you what progressive means, because all of those bands, and specifically, yes, created complex pieces of music. They were orchestral. They were symphonic. But in the old days, meaning the 60s and 70s, you had progressive FM radio that kind of supported that experimental kind of music. And we don't have that anymore. Plus, we have the start of the short American attention span. And so seven or eight minute songs are like out of the question now. I mean, is there a market for that anymore? Well, there is. There's a, a underground sort of movement that has been going along rock and roll ever since I've been involved with it. And Progressive rock has its diehard fans. And, you know, these are the people who actually enjoy seeing musicians play their instruments. And as you said, we live in this short soundbite world now. And a, and a lot of the music that is created nowadays is actually sampled, and lifted, and then they do things on top of pre-recorded pieces of music that we knew. But progressive rock is where things are really played by hand, so to speak, and mm -hmm. expressed in a different way. And I think the fan base has grown over the years, and they are now indoctrinating their kids into this. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times in these meet and greets after the concerts, I meet the dad, and then I meet the two 14, 15 year old kids who came with them and just start raving about yes music to me. And I, I'm always telling them, you know, you're you're at the pathfinders for this. You know, you guys are leading the way, so keep the movement going. But was, it's what, it's out there and it's strong. Was mm -hmm. there historically a lot of pressure for hooks? And, uh, you know, just radio, you know, we need something, we need a hook for radio. Well, there's always that desire. Radio's changed, as you know, so much, but there's still always that desire to have something, quote unquote, kind of radio friendly. Um, in progressive rock, you might find that is uh, edited out of a 12 minute long song that they've got the components down to its three or four minutes that's really hooky. In my case, personally speaking, I see progressive rock in a way where you can have those lengthy songs and you can also have a more commercially form fitted song as long as it's interesting to the listener and, and very entertaining and the textures and the colors and the sounds are interesting. To me, that's the world that I live in. Um, you know, I have a, a new album out coming out February 12th called Arc of Life. And the first single from the record is called You Make It Real, which is on its face a pretty straight ahead pop kind of song. 
But when you dig down underneath what's really going on and making it up, the bass parts, the guitar parts, the drums, there's a complexity within that simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's what I enjoy about the genre the most is being able to to play with all those textures, you know? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. You can hear that song on the internet now. I don't know if it's your website or I was looking up some of your stuff, but it's there and you've got the band performing. It's a, it's quite quite a beautiful song with a high tenor voice that is kind of reminiscent of Yes, and I love yeah. that. And I want to talk about Yes, but, but not yet. <laughs> uh, what I mean is, uh, yes is a great example of you getting to take the place of your greatest hero bass player in the band that you love the most, which is like a double realization of an incredible dream. Isn't that crazy? It's, I mean, it's, it, you it's know, crazy. My, I have a long history in music with my family, and I grew up listening to jazz. You know, my first memories are sitting under my dad's white grand piano while my mother played drums and they sorted out the Dixieland jazz band <laughs> to go do the gigs in Vegas, you know. Talk about so your I dad. Was, Fam I was introduced to music, good, great, real music at an early age. And yes, became one of those things for me at 12 years old where I discovered it and it was religion, you know. So growing up and, and seeing my first yes concert in Vegas and watching the band and, and watching this guy, Chris Squire, who played great, sang great, looked cool. It was all there. I just remember thinking, that's what I will really want to do. If I could do something as cool as that, I'll be happy. And as fate has it, my career uh, path evolves and I meet Chris Squire in 87. We become fast friends. And I'm now involved in that loop in, in terms of writing and production and behind the scenes and then eventually tour with them and and produce some of their records and and I somehow end up joining the band as a as a band member in the 90s and and the one thing that came about in 2015 which none of us expected was Chris passed away I mean he was he was we, we all thought he'd be the last man standing and um, it was a pretty shocking moment when he asked me to take his place I I didn't really grab the concept of what was going on at the time because I never imagined in a million years of doing it but it's what he really wanted to happen was yes to carry on and thrive, which is a pretty amazing thing when you think about a guy whose career was as deep and, and legacy filled as his was to actually hand the keys to someone and say, keep it going was a pretty amazing moment and uh, something I don't take lightly. And I, I honor his, his, his wishes and we go forward doing that, you know. It's just an amazing path. I used to, it used to, I used to sit around and wonder how the hell this happened. Now I just put my hands in the air and, and let fate take me wherever it's going to go. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to embrace what comes towards us. And as surreal as it seems, we have to uh, cherish and honor it. And that's what you're doing. So it's, yeah. quite, it's quite commendable. And it's my favorite band of all time, which is the strangest cherry on top, you know? Exactly. So, yeah. So and, you, and, okay. and you know, uh, Billy, there's a cosmic arc between... Chris also becoming a fan of yours and sort of insisting you were a hesitant concert performer. You, you, you were more comfortable doing the session work. Yeah. And so he talked you into going on stage. He talked you into going on tour and kept pulling you back into yes when you thought you had retired your interest in yes. And yeah. then you get all the way to the end of his life, the third act of his life, when he was so insistent about you playing with a band and then you had this epiphany that the whole thing he was setting you up for was for you to continue the legacy of Yes after he was gone, after his very sudden, unexpected yeah. death, which is, it's really a very touching story. Talk about that phone call uh, at the end. Well, I made a record uh, called The Prague Collective, and I was inviting various guests onto the record. Chris was living in Arizona at the time, and... I told him I need you to play on this record. He said, sure, but I can't leave Arizona. So I drove to Arizona. We set up in a motel with a mobile studio. And there he was, larger than life, playing great, did his thing. We went out to an amazing dinner and had a great time. Uh, I drove home and a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of days later, his wife phoned me and said, Chris didn't really tell you what he wanted to tell you because he couldn't, which was, he's just been diagnosed with 
this serious leukemia cancer and he doesn't have long to live. And that just shocked me beyond words. Then Chris and I spoke, she handed the phone to Chris and, and we started talking about, I, I was promoting the idea that he can beat this because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just an eternal optimist. And I, I said, you know, you'll, you'll beat this, just take some time and you'll beat this. And so we spoke uh, from that point was about six weeks in those conversations in the, in the first part of the, that period, he would call me and say, you know, the guys really want to keep touring. We have this tour going out with Toto supporting the band, you know, opening up for the band and then we're going to play, but the guys really want to go, but I can't go. And I kept saying to him, I, first time I said to him, I said, well, you're Chris Squire. They're just going to have to wait. So just call them and tell them to wait. They'll wait. Don't worry about it. You know? And he would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Calls me the next day and, we talk about this, that, and the other. And then the conversation goes back into that same thing where he says to me, you know, the guys really want a tour and, and, you know, I'm worried about it. And I said, well, you can't worry about anything but your health right now. So you need to, as I told you yesterday, when you get off the phone with me, call the guys and tell them that they're going to have to wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Third time he calls me next day. The guys really want a tour. I, I said, Chris, for God's sake, tell them to wait. He goes, you're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> he was a very funny guy. And that's one of the reasons we hit it off so amazingly quickly. We just, we laughed more than we did anything. So he said, you're just not getting it. I said, what's that? He goes, I need you to take my place. And when he said that, I mean, still makes me, you know, a little upset, but the concepts running through my mind, it, it flashed like they say, when you die, you see your whole life in front of you. I mean, I went from being, I saw the whole path and it was incredibly sad that I was being asked this. It was also something that was like, I couldn't really believe at the time. And, but my instincts, because he was my brother, you know, I told him instantly, I got you. Don't worry about this. So you heal while I go out and do this. But I said, I want you to, you have to do me a favor and you have to announce to the public that you're coming back because I don't want anyone looking like an ambulance, like an amb I'm an ambulance chaser. I want them to know you're coming back. That's the intent here. I'm just going to step in for a little while. So he did that. And the fan base was very, very warm and accepting of this concept because they knew my relationship with Chris we had bands outside of Yes, and you know we were friends. The band knew that the, the fans knew this, and so as we started rehearsing and and things are progressing, this is getting towards the tail end of that six weeks I described. He was coming to terms with his own mortality, I think, more so than I even was, and he started changing the conversation into, "Look, you have to." You, I need you to carry on with this when I'm gone. And I said, what do you mean when you're gone? I'm, you're not going anywhere. Just get into the hospital and get yourself together. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I go, I want you to promise me that you know, you're going to keep going. And, and I kept shunning that part of the conversation until it got down to the last like few days. And, you know, when he asked me just to put his mind at rest, I told him, I got you. You know, I, I, I'm in. I'll do this. And, you know, the, the support of the fans, the support of the other guys in the band, quite frankly, you know, gave me the strength to do it. Now, out of everything I've done in my career, which is a lot of stuff at this point, that was the most difficult tour ever to do. Because many reasons, the, the thoughts going through my head were if I step out on stage and it sucks and, th and this thing falls apart, it's all going to be my fault. It will all fall on me that this is why this didn't work. And then the other part was I got to stare at these yes fans who are looking at this spot and Chris isn't there. And then there was the few occasions where his family was sitting in the audience, his, his wife. And then when we were in England, his brother and his sister, Oh man, I was a mess. It was really super difficult, but the love and the warmth and the support I got from everyone, including his family, was so overwhelming that it kind of gave me a sense of purpose. And, and I just kept thinking of what Chris wanted. And so now after all these years, you know, I, 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 it's, it's my sword that I go into battle with. And, 
I'm very proud of the band and what we've done. And it's, it's hard to believe it's six years later. You know, it's been six years now. How has uh, knowing him impacted you? Well, obviously it changed my entire career trajectory. Um, And it, it uh, has allowed me to be in what is the most joyful thing ever in music that gave me joy. I mean, you know, I don't want to name other bands, but if I was asked to join this band or that band, I may have done it because it was a paycheck, but I wouldn't have been as like, I have played some of my favorite music ever and continue to with what I think are some of the best musicians in the business. I mean, so he, he altered my entire career trajectory and uh you know it's 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 just a very strange fate filled sort of life that i'm i'm living here and and i i'm thankful for it and i don't take it for granted and i i work very hard to to make it as best i can you know i mean you're always going to have those people uh, a very small percentage at this point who are you know the band should have stopped without chris and this that and the other and the idea is well actually chris is the one who wanted it to keep going so uh, we're just going to carry on if you don't mind <laughs> you know in, in other circumstances that could have been a nightmare we've, we've seen a lot of bands um uh where it took longer for the new member to prove himself. For instance, uh, Deacon Fry that took over for his dad when his dad passed away in the Eagles. Although yeah. the name was very fondly thought of among Eagles fans, he still had to prove himself as the ability to fill that notch. But the truth is you had been in and out of the band's life uh, for a while. You had done session work and you had been on stage. So this wasn't like a new introduction. So, I mean, you were a little bit ahead of the curve that way in gaining acceptance of the Died in the Wool Yes fans, right? I think that was a huge factor in it. And I think it also gave the band itself the confidence to know that this was the right way to go. Um, you know, as I said, I produced stuff in the past. I toured with them. My first tour was in 94. What's interesting is I've toured, I think I'm the only guy who's toured with the different lineups that are, because Yes is a very political band. There's a sort of revolving door at the front of who comes in and who goes, and this guy's out and he's back. And, and um, you know, I've, never, I've, I've always said you're never really in Yes until you're out of it, and then you get back. <laughs> <laughs> then you're in. Can you talk about uh, the members of Arc of Life? Well, well, Arc of Life is um, John Davison, who is the lead singer of Yes right now. Um, Jay Shellen, who is the additional drummer uh, within Yes uh, um, and supporting the band that way. Jimmy Hahn is a guitar player friend of mine who was in the band Logic with me, which was my first band ever. And he's been in other bands. He played with me and Chris and Conspiracy. And so, so there's a family tree kind of link there. And the keyboard player's name is Dave Kersner, who is a... Uh, incredibly talented solo artist in his own right has bands and um, is also the owner of a company called IK Multimedia, which if you're a musician, you turn to a lot of their stuff to use. So not only was it a cool thing to have him in the band, but it's like I can get some of the free software from him too. (laughs) (laughs) That's very funny. Hey, you were talking about the politics in the band. So political are they. Uh, There are two yeses uh, currently performing or will be as soon as the pandemic's over. You have the yes uh, with John Anderson called, and that this might be, this is before the departure of Rick Waitman. Yeah, ARW, which was Anderson, Raven, and Wakeman, correct? And then you have the other one, which was Steve Howe, and who was the other one? Alan White, Steve Howe, Jeff Downs, um, myself, and John. So how does that work? Well, yes, as it's known now, yes, official, because it had to identify itself that way, which is kind of silly. But that's where yes is. That's what it was, and that's where it continues to be going forward. There have been other offshoots. Um, Strangely, how I got involved with all this is back in the uh, late 80s, um, John Anderson and the other guys had, had, John had left Yes, and there was a band called Anderson Bruford Wakeman Howe. It sounds like a lawyer firm, right? <laughs> but they, they were on Arista Records at the time, making records and touring, playing the music of Yes, but they weren't called Yes. Yes was on ATCO without a lead singer, which was Chris, Tony Kay, Trevor Raven, and Alan White. 
the guy who signed my second album called World Trade, his name is Derek Shulman. He's an, he was a huge big time mogul back in the day, still is. He signed my band uh, to Polydor and at, you know, the deal with regime change and record companies and whatnot. So he, he moved and became the president of Atco Records where he was with Yes Without a Lead Singer. And he says to Chris Squire, I know the guy who should be your lead singer. His name's Billy Sherwood. You got to meet this guy. So we met and became friends, as I said, and everyone thought it was a, an amazing idea that I do this. Chris, the band, the lawyers, the managers, everyone thought it was great except for me. I knew that it would be <laughs> career suicide. And I was very young at the time, you know, 20 plus, whatever it was. I had the wisdom enough to know that it's like this thing is a ginormous machine and it's going to roll right over me if I step into this because the lawyers are going to arrange for these guys to get together. This is not over yet, you know? And sure enough, that's what happened. And they made an album called Union, which is where they went on tour as an eight piece band with both of those bands uniting and becoming one under the yes flag. Um, I have a song on that record. Uh, it's kind of a fan favorite. It's called The More We Live that I wrote with Chris. But it was at that point I stepped away from the vehicle and sort of knew th th that that was my tenure with yes. Long story short, they switched lineups. They come back out with the 90125 lineup, which had Owner of a Lonely Heart, which was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. And they go tour in 1994, and they, they called me to, to join them as a multi-instrumentalist on stage and play some guitar and keys and sing and whatnot. I actually did a double bass thing with Chris on, on one piece, which was amazing. And when that was finished, we got off the plane in LAX. That band broke up. I watched it standing in front of the Bradley terminal, no one talking to anyone. That's the end of the band. And wow. I kind of scratched my head and thought, wow, I just watched my favorite band end. And wow. I thought that was the end. And then I got a call several months later from Chris. Hey, we're, we reformed the classic lineup as it's known with Anderson Wakeman, Steve Howe, Alan and Chris. And we're making this live album. We'd like you to mix it in your studio. I had a studio in Van Nuys for years. So I mixed it. One thing leads to another. They, they called me back and said, we had a great time working with you. We thought, you know, you're, you're, the way we worked together was great. Could you produce the next one? So I produced and recorded the next one. It's at that point where I finished mixing that album. Literally, as I was finishing it, the phone rang. John Anderson picks up the phone and kind of looks a little distraught. And I said, what's going on? He said, Rick Wakeman just quit. Now, they were supposed to go out on a big tour like several weeks later. So the band, again, broke up in front of my eyes. And it was at that point I kind of had the courage and the sort of wisdom and, the, and the, the fortitude. I looked at Chris. I said, I can't watch this band stop. We've got to take some initiative. And we started writing material, which became ultimately the Open Your Eyes record. And that's when they asked me to join as a full member. So I was a guitar player on stage and writer with the band for the Open Your Eyes record and the latter and, and in the band. And then I... I left in 2000 because I felt I'd kind of done enough. I could do all I could do. And I, I went into jingles here in LA for a while. And well, Rick and Wakeman kind of, was in and out of the band almost as many times as you were. He left the band like five times, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, but he, he was a, he was kind of an iconic keyboard figure on his own. Oh, he still is. And he's actually a pretty big deal in England as far as like a comic and, and a, he does a stand up thing with his piano and wow. Got shows and yeah, he's he's very prolific in in that way. So I, I have a I have a question about the brand name of a band because I'm assuming that it's kind of it gets to the point where it's like a battle of the lawyers. And if it, if it's a legacy band such as Yes or Asia, that it's that brand is owned by someone, and then a lot of the musicians that you're looking at on the stage are hired, even if they're original members. So, what can you share with us about how all of that works? Well, you license your band when you first start. And, you know, when you're starting a band, no one's sitting around thinking this is going to last 50 years. So let's make sure that all of the I's are dotted, <laughs> E's are crossed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the legalities get a little fuzzy along the way. But um, yes, has always had a, a, a standard within itself that if, if there's three guys who keep it going and we're in it before that it can keep going. And so that's the way it's worked and continues to. And um, it was really, yes, was without any competitors, if you will, or, or satellite versions trying to, um, to, to claim their space. For, for many, many years, it was only 
uh, a few years ago that Anderson, Rabin, and Wakeman decided to start working together, and they went out and toured as ARW. That's how they toured. And then I guess somewhere about a year into that process, um, they decided that they wanted to call themselves Yes. So they switched the name around, and it became uh, Anderson, Bruford, uh, Anderson, Rabin, Wakeman of Yes or featuring... And then the lawyers come in to have to define how you can call it and what you can call it. And then, then that's when we became, yes, official because we had to, you know. So, yes, it's sticky and it's kind of messy. But at the end of the day, um, you know, here we are going forward. You know, we just finished our last tour when COVID kicked in. And we've got several more tours planned already before COVID's even done. Uh, and... ARW it is actually is no more. They they kind of parked it and and, and went back to their their worlds. Trevor Raven's a huge uh, film composer in LA and, and has stuff doing you know constantly. Rick Wakeman's constantly doing his thing and John John does solo things. So the commitment to yes though has always been a unique one and one that I've seen up close and personal and remain involved with and it remains intact and as we go forward you know. Let me ask you about being on stage with Yes, the complete Yes, before they bifurcated. Yeah. And when you're doing a show with a legendary band, uh, first of all, it's astonishing the money that these legacy bands, these, well, I call them boomer bands from the 60s and 70s, are making on the concert tour. I mean, the Eagles are getting $2,000 a ticket. for. I mean, it's insane, the amount of money. You almost can't pass this opportunity up. But, wait, but when you do the concert, there's a big quotient of nostalgia. And so the audience is there to hear the familiar and not so familiar deep album cuts from your history. How... Um, forgiving are they of you playing your newer experimental stuff when you do a concert? I mean, is there an equation like you have to do this much of what they're familiar with so you can do a little bit with what they're not it, familiar with? Yeah, you find that balance if there's a new album, not to push it too hard, that envelope, and give them what they want. Because as you said, that's that's that nostalgia weighs very heavy. Um, so there is a careful portioning mm -hmm. of it. Uh, yeah. That said, Yes hasn't had a live a, a, a studio album out in a while. So our our recent cycles of touring have been based on what is we call the album series tour. So, uh, for instance, one year we went out and, and the only thing we played was the full uh, drama album and two sides of Tales from Topographic Ocean. So that was it, you know. And and so each album series has has its theme. The next um tour that we do is actually going to be the relayer album um uh, from the series and the good news for me is that you know whereas you know most bands go out there and play their their hits and they think they, they're pretty quick and they go by when we play one of those quote nostalgia songs it's like strap in because it's going to take a while <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's 22 minutes long to enjoy yeah. the process. So it's, it's selfishly actually quite cool. <laughs> to play yeah. As a musician. Absolutely. Do you yeah. tend to play these, these pieces the same way every time, or do you do some improv improvisation or yeah. jamming well, it, if you will? It's interesting because I get asked that quite a bit because Yes, music is very in its way, you know, as Fritz said earlier, it's kind of got this orchestral component. So you can't go out there and play da 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 without playing <laughs> da, da 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 you know what I mean? Or you're going to screw yeah. people up all night long. So <laughs> we have a, found a way to paint within the lines, but there's also always a differential going on every night. And, you know, whether it's in the solo or whether it's in the rhythms, there's... Or, or the bass lines themselves, I might embellish here and there and do some different things. Um, but always knowing where that center line is that you have to kind of maintain, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like you don't want to take the car too far off the road, mm -hmm. but you can kind of use both lanes and, and sort of swerve around in there. Play a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your dad and your, your, the music history within your family? 
Well, um, my dad was a big band leader and he had an amazing career that I keep discovering things about even at this age. Um, he was Bing Crosby's guitar player when he was 21. Wow. wow. Pretty amazing. And I, I have this amazing poster here in the studio of dad on, on it's a Gibson endorsement ad, like one of the first times they went for endorsement ads and they have like 10 different guitar players of the era all sitting there in this black and white, you know. And what's amazing to think about when you look at it is there's no pickups on any of the guitars. <laughs> they weren't there yet. Wow. <laughs> so you just kind of strum the hell out of this thing and hope to be heard. But he was an amazing guitar player. He's also just, he played every instrument. And, you know, I, I people think I play every instrument. I don't play trumpet. I don't play trombone, you know. But my dad could play trumpet like Hendrix could play guitar. I mean, he was a shredder. It's crazy. And great piano chops, great writing chops. And his career evolved from being, you know, a musician behind the scenes to having his own band, Bobby Sherwood, big band. I have records, Battle of the Bands with Duke Ellington, Bobby Sherwood, Tommy Dorsey. And, you Holy know, cow. He was in that world. Uh, he had a song called The Elks Parade, Sherwood's Forest, that was a million seller for Capital uh, back in the day. And... So his career evolved and then he went into television when when television, there was no television. OK, and then you <laughs> turned on this box and on came the Milton Berle show, which is one of the first television shows ever. My dad was his Ed McMahon, if you will. Oh, wow. And they oh, were buddies God. so close that actually Milton is was bless him, was my godfather. Wow. wow. So um their their kind of friendship developed and and dad started doing other television shows there was a a show called masquerade party that's a lot like this show that's out now with the mask it's kind of like a it's mm -hmm. kind of the same thing but back in the day he was on that he was on a bunch of different shows and then he went into film and he's in a film called pal joey with frank sinatra uh where he plays frank's big band leader but it was Strangely, out of all of his musical stuff that is, to me, the most remarkable, he has a star on Hollywood and Vine um, down in Hollywood on the Walk of Fame, and it's it's got a television icon, and that was for the Milton Berle show. Okay. Because it's wow. such a thing, right? But so, so my dad has his career going. My mother is a chorus line dancer, a Broadway showgirl in uh, New York at the time. The two of them meet, and fall in love, start a family, and they migrate to Vegas during the sort of golden era of the Rat Pack, you know, when the gangsters owned Vegas and, and it was kind of the place to be. He took root there and started doing all kinds of different shows up and down the strip in, in the big rooms and the small rooms, all kinds of stuff, just working constantly. And that's where I was born in 65 and uh grew up there and and kind of watching entertainment and seeing how everything went and then then my career path kind of started but but dad and mom were a huge part of my, my mother still plays drums she lives in palm Springs, plays golf she played at her last birthday party she's got great chops and wow. <laughs> you know, it's just funny to watch i see a book in here my friend you've got a you've got a great me uh, right? music memoir um and, and the funny thing is that my dad's parents, okay, were in vaudeville, Gail wow. and Bobby Sherwood. And I have, uh, if I could turn it around, I'd show you these pictures on the wall. They're amazing from, from that era of, of his band with these other 10 guys standing there with the bow ties. It's, it's incredible. And, and they had a long career in vaudeville, which is how my dad got the bug, obviously. But the thing that I discovered recently, because my cousin Carl is an amazing trumpet player. Carl Saunders. He sends me some pictures that he found of Gail and Robert. This is when Baldwin Pianos is first coming onto the scene publicly and they're trying to sell pianos now commercially and, and they're, they're doing one of those endorsement ads. They strapped Gail, my grandmother, into a gondola and set her aloft and she's 3,000 feet in the air <laughs> playing a grand wow. piano. And I have all the pictures to prove it. It's that is unbelievable. Grand. And yeah. I thought to myself, I will go to great lengths to be in this business, but you're not getting me in a balloon. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. So how did your parents feel about your music? 
Well, my dad passed away when I was um, maybe just out of high school because he was actually oh. quite older than my mother. Okay. So I lost him early. Um, but he knew where my path was going because I was out in L.A. pursuing it and going for a record deal and, and trying to get things going. My mother, you know, she's she's just incredibly proud and she's as blown away as I am of how this whole path worked because, you know, she was the one I would go to and say, Ma, you got to get me tickets. Yes, it's at the Aladdin tonight. Well, how much are they? Well, they're this much. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> and I need two. You know, and OK, here and I need a hundred bucks for the merchandise. What? <laughs> So it was kind of funny when I became a full member on the first tour in my mom's backstage, I made sure to have all the merch gathered. Yeah, and free said, merch from now I, on. I said I can finally repay you for all the yeah. merch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> let let so me speak. ask you about um, your, your, your hyphen, your musician hyphen producer as well. Mm. There are so many interesting uh, electronic options in the studio now. And when I was listening to some of the Yes music and all the beautiful uh, riffs, the, the beautiful guitar riff at the beginning of Roundabout and all, how maybe some of these newer, um, for lack of a better term, instruments would have enhanced some of their earlier orchestral stuff. It really would have been interesting to see where they specifically as the preeminent progressive band would have gone with all the experimental possibilities with new electronic instruments and stuff. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about music at its core is it still comes down to six strings on a piece of wood. You know what I mean? If you're uh, a guitar player. Yeah. Uh, or if you're a drummer, it's just a good set of drums. Now, we have evolved where there's samples of all this stuff. So I could sit here in the studio right now and I could make it sound like there's a guy strumming a 12 string guitar and you wouldn't know the difference. But for me, I enjoy the randomness of the human experience in a studio and, and capturing that is to me where the art is, is, is in capturing those moments. Um, I think the most influential thing in, in the transition from the sort of old school analog to where we are now is the conversion into the digital realm of recording. And, you know, I, I used to have an old, uh, the two inch tape, you know, with the big 24 track machine and the studio with 72 channels. And, and now I, you know, I'm mixing records at 30,000 feet on my laptop. You know what <laughs> I mean? Because I've got everything right in there. So things have changed in that way. There's a lot of analog diehards who, they don't like the digital conversion, but but for me, I, I love it because it it affords so much more creativity in terms of uh, just file sharing, for instance. I make a lot of records where I've got guest artists. You mentioned one of them, the Super Tramp album and, and the Pink Floyd tribute that I did. These are records that come about by virtue of file share in a lot of ways, because there's guys in England, there's guys in, you know, Nebraska. You can't, you can't get those sessions together unless you just file share. So I, I do a lot of file sharing in that regard to get things done. And it's kind of funny because one guy asked me in an interview, you know, what do you think about analog to digital? How do you feel about it? I said, let me just tell you this. No one is asking me to send them a 24 track tape when I need them to do the <laughs> <laughs> are you old, one of the uh, are you one of the new proponents of going back to the old vinyl? Some people say it's a clearer, warmer sound. How do you well, I appreciate vinyl and those who like to listen to it. I am kind of weird, and I, I found that for me, back in the day, vinyl the first five or six plays were yep. unreal, mm -hmm. and then from there it was just downhill because you know <laughs> for me, I'd listen to my Yes records so much that before it started, you hear, <laughs> and so it's, I couldn't see through my own needle haze to hear the song. <laughs> so for me, digital is, is, is just a world of clarity that I really appreciate. There's some mm -hmm. who say it's not as warm. There's some who say this, I don't know. I've worked with a lot of uh, different producers and, and had this conversation. One guy who I had a huge amount of respect for, Keith Olson, who produced the World Trade album, he was one of the first to go to digital back in the uh, day, back in the 80s. And, uh, you know, his theory was make it sound great, make it sound the way you want it to sound. And then when you record it, 
it will be that way for all time because it's ones and zeros. There's no loss of any kind. Um, to that end, I, I remember experiencing that myself a little bit, working on a record at my studio. When you had 24 track tape, that big analog tape, the machines would get hot. You know, they roll around the cap stands and all this journey that the tape used you to get to clean the heads with alcohol. I used to. Have oh to my do god, that. and the yeah. azimuth and all this stuff. It was a real <laughs> deal. But what I was getting at is this: is there was a thing called shed that used to happen, and shed was from the process of the tape rolling around all the heads and, and the cap stand. There'd be minute little particles of the tape that would collect by the cap stand, and one day I was just kind of looking down at my machine, going, "I wonder." what part of the sound is that right there? <laughs> and I had been converting to digital at that point, And it was at that point that I kind of made the leap and I, I've never really looked back since mm -hmm. then. Talk yeah, about your virtual clinics. Ah, that's kind of funny. I, I was always being asked to do lessons and I never had the time, quite frankly, because I was just busy in the studio and busy doing records. So COVID kicks into the gear and it's it's like going from light speed to zero overnight and a couple like maybe a month into COVID I'm kind of thinking to myself I haven't seen a human being <laughs> in so long because we're all in that lockdown mode right but maybe doing a lesson or two right now would be kind of cool for me more than even them because I could have some human contact you know <clears throat> excuse me so I I put out the word that I would start doing lessons and guitar, bass, drums, songwriting, engineering, whatever you want to get into. And um, it actually, I got a lot of people contacting me and I started getting quite busy doing that. And I still do it now. I've slowed down because I'm, I'm kind of deeper into a lot of production stuff at this point, but I still take it on and, and do lessons with people. And it's just kind of a cool thing to be able to impart some information that someone wants to know and, and help them along their way. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So a lot of people ask me about techniques. How do you do this? How do you do that? And I'll show them and they'll go, oh, I didn't realize it was that. And, and so just sharing that knowledge is kind of a cool thing. You know, it's been gratifying. So I want to get one more plug in for Arc of Life. It's a beautiful, uh, uh, a lovely sound. And again, you posted the single on the Internet and the LP drops on February 12th. Is it Frontier Records? Am I right about that? Yes, it's Frontier Records, it's and uh, and really, it's uh, it's 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 a clean, lovely sound, and I hope you'll support Billy. You've had an amazing career, and uh, and uh, from an interesting historical perspective, your whole family. But I want to ask you about, and I know you talk to your other musician friends about this, so. What do you think is going to happen post pandemic? How long is it going to take for people to be comfortable in a in a large venue setting to come and hear live music again? Well, I think that a lot of that's going to be psychologically based with the vaccine kind of kicking into gear and hopefully some herd immunity on the side, a side order of herd immunity. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> And the confidence to sort of like step out of your front door and go for it. You know, I mean, we, we risk everything in life as we drive around every day. So there's that feeling of, uh oh, but, you know, at some point we're going to have to reengage the world here. It's just a matter of how it's going to layer back into normal. And I, I think eventually, I don't know how long it'll take, but it'll be, wow, do you remember COVID? You know, you remember when we were, but right now we're in it. So it's hard to imagine it, but um, I, I'm the eternal optimist and, and, and always looking for the future to be brighter than today. And just as an example, you know, we can go outside and sit in a restaurant again here in LA, yeah. which is like a milestone. It's major. And are, uh, are promoters booking things, hoping to say everything after September will be clear again. So are they booking venues or is it too early for that? Well, what's happened a lot, which I'm noticing with us and with other artists is that everything that was booked when, when the, stop button kicked in it's just been postponed for a year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the, everything's in place to go um and i think that once the key is turned and and, and that moment comes it's going to look like black friday at walmart <laughs> <laughs> i think so too that we're missing that communal feeling i really think it'll happen it'll take a second but then it'll explode 
Yeah, I mean, you know, just to go see a trio at at a restaurant or something, you know yeah. what I mean? And I picture this world where we're talking to strangers and we're cheering busboys and we're just <laughs> more communal and more engaged with strangers, even at the movie theater. We're just yeah. going to be like super duper friendly for a, a while, just in celebration of, of this community that we're finally able to share with one another. So I think people yeah. are going to meet that way. I think you know, so too. And I think it's, it's such a visceral reaction, you know, music and, you know, film and art, all of those arts forms we've kind of we as a people we were never up against this so we never imagined what what do you mean i can't go to a concert and so when a concert came up you were kind of like ah i don't know maybe i'll go maybe i won't now it's going to be like i'm going i you need to I mean? be there mm -hmm. and so we look forward to that and and arc of life is definitely going to be playing live shows as well fortunately we're managed by the same people who manage yes Mm -hmm. So the dots can all be connected in the right way. TKO agency is our agent. So they're ready to book. So all of the, the you know, it's like a bunch of cars at the starting line with the engines just yeah. waiting <laughs> to see that light, you know? Yep. 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 Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Billy, I, I, I just wanted to thank you uh, for all the beautiful sounds you've put into the universe and your great reflections on the history of this amazing band. Yes and rock in general. I was really looking forward to talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I mean, you know, I, again, I got to thank Tim Conway Jr. and Sharon Belly over there for connecting the yes, dots. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, They're the best. Yeah. It's just and been I, a great time. So thank yeah, you. Yeah. And I thank think you. like that what I'm seeing about you is beyond your talent. The reason why you're always uh, the guy is that you're just so joyful. And so you're yeah. that guy that everybody wants on their team. I'm trying to get the guest spot next to Tim Conway. Ah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you're, that's oh, that's probably, that would be a good get on his part. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? When you're doing, when, when the tour gets booked again with Arc of Life, bring the guys back on when you're sitting there and we'll, we'll help you yeah, promote we'll it. We'll talk about it. That yeah. would be awesome. Stay safe, my friend. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, much. Billy. Take care, Take care. guys. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. Now, Wheezy, we don't usually do this on our show, but I think under these circumstances, because two of these these two people are so um, historic in their place in entertainment history, it bears mentioning today. And that is the passing of Cicely Tyson and Cloris Leachman. Uh, Cicely Tyson was a pioneering black actress. She gained fame in the 1970s at a time when television and film were just finally beginning to recognize the talent and humanity of African-American performers, and specifically women. She grabbed viewers by the heart in her portrayal of the sharecropper's wife in Sounder, and that's the role that pretty much put her on the map with an Oscar nomination. She won two Emmy Awards for her 1974 portrayal of a 110-year-old former slave, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. She won a Tony in 2013 at 88 years old for the revival of A Trip to Bountiful. She was born in the Caribbean. She was a force, 96 years old. We're so sad about her passing. And also Cloris Leachman. I, I, in, in my opinion, one of the funniest people ever to act on television or in film, but not always comedic. She did some beautiful, dramatic roles. As a matter of fact, she was uh, a, a winner of a Best Supporting Oscar for Peter Bogdanovich's Last Picture Show, and that was not a funny role. But she is hysterical. She, she will be remembered, I think, most greatly for her delightfully neurotic Phyllis Lindstrom character on The Mary Tyler Moore Show. She won eight primetime Emmys for comedy and drama, She's had various successes on Broadway, but my favorite role of hers, uh, a couple of roles were in the Mel Brooks movies, Young Frankenstein, mm -hmm. and my absolute favorite, I've seen at least 50 times, was High Anxiety, where she plays Nurse Diesel, <laughs> opposite Harvey Corman who had this fetish-infused relationship on the film. I mean, she and Harvey were just two people where they didn't even have to say anything, and I would laugh hysterically. Yeah. So we're very sorry at her passing. She lived to be 94 years old. Two, two giants in the industry. We don't do that often, but we wanted to reflect on people that meant a lot to us. Absolutely. That was beautifully done. Thank you, Fritz. Mm -hmm. uh, they will be missed and li lives, uh, beautiful lives. And uh, that they shared so much of themselves that we still get to enjoy forever is just such a gift to us.
Yeah, go ahead. You so can are you ready out. for the credits for It's a yes, Piece myself? I okay. It's my favorite I, part of the show. I mention it every week, but it's important that people know. Uh, we would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. And we would love to know what media you have been enjoying. So you can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. Com. I want to thank our guest, Billy Sherwood. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Alex Gilroy, and you. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path. <laughs> <laughs>